Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, Katrin did already a very nice uh, overview of uh, where I'm from and what my research interests are. Um, so just to remind you a little bit that my perspective is a little bit different maybe from, from yours or from the other presenters. So I'm more looking from a climate perspective on clouds um, as seen by satellites. And I, I, I won't cover all satellite uh, instruments here, but only the, the ones which are yeah, called uh, visible and near and infrared imagers. It's like a passive instruments, and I'm going to have a few slides on these uh, instruments explaining some, some characteristics of them. Um, okay, and basically, as I was saying, that we, or I look a little bit from a climate perspective, uh, Katrin introduced this project here at CMSAF, so it's a climate monitoring satellite application facility, uh, uh, sponsored by or funded by, partly funded by UMITSAT. And in this uh, context, we basically develop or compose long-term data sets out of cloud properties derived from satellite images and do like a climate analysis on them. Okay. This one. Uh, so I, I'm going to have just one or two slides on the CMSAF project to give you a little bit more information. It's, uh, it's a European project, as I was saying, funded by UMITSAT sitting at Darmstadt here. And a couple of so the dark uh, blue countries are involved in this project. Um, and you see the, the logos here. And just to summarize, what we do is that we have this, the mandate to generate climate data records in an operational environment, which sort of requires calibrated and cross-calibrated radiances. So the measurement needs to be prepared uh, very well for, for our applications. And um, yeah, if, if you look at this cycle, basically, we, so we, we observe um, it's not only limited to clouds, but we also do like water vapor and, and radiation components, or components of the radiation budget, which we observe. And um, once we have this observation, we create data sets out of that. Um, we can sort of monitor the climate variability, which leads to a better understanding of the climate, um, which actually then comes to this modeling part where, we, uh, where climate models can actually be validated and improved using those data sets. And then if you look at the other side of this, uh, this circle here, that of course has some sort of um, improved uh, prediction of the climate attached to it. And then also if you, if you know how the climate is gonna change, uh, you can um, well have some mitigation adaptation uh, options basically. Okay, this is just a, a short summary on, on the CMSAF project. Um, okay, and before I'm gonna go into detail, I'm just uh, curious a little bit on how much you guys have been involved in uh, these kind of uh, three topics, so to say. And I just would like to ask you, maybe you can raise your hand, uh, who of you actually have actually worked with AVHR models or severely like data? And I'm not just talking about the products, but also sort of like the, the pure measurements, like brightness temperatures and radiances, and who knows about the uh, orbital characteristics and how much channels those instruments have? It's like a few, like five, six, seven, maybe. Okay, so please, if you, if you have any question in the in the course of my of my um, of my presentation, don't hesitate to interrupt me and just just ask questions. Okay, and then um, yeah, and this is a little bit towards the um, topic or the the exercise we are going to have afterwards this this lecture, uh, in which we will actually work a little bit with the measurements itself to give you some sort of feeling of what is required to go from from the actual measurement of the satellite to uh, some any kind of product, right? We will have a very simple uh, um, examples here, which will be like cloud mass or cloud top height, which you will be implementing. It's it's um, you will see afterwards. It's very uh, simple to have, to have a simple approach there. And yes, maybe the last question is anyone uh, familiar with uh, radio um, transfer modeling? So we have one, two, three hands. Okay. So and again, if you have any questions, and you know. And you, there are certain points you just don't know what I'm talking about. Just interrupt me and then I ask questions, okay? Good, so coming to the outline of my presentation in this one and a half uh, hours, uh, I will have a few slides on the passive images, what they are, what characteristic are, characteristics are. I'm gonna, fo gonna be focusing on Severi. You have had some uh, examples of some products uh, uh, derived from Severi already yesterday. Um, I have a very few slides on, on the uh, assimilation of 
passive image uh, measurements in uh, NWP models, and that uh, is sort of some sort of nice uh, addition to the presentations we had already yesterday, um, because you can use by direct assimilation of the radiances in cloudy and clear sky uh, conditions, you can improve the, the NWP state and the forecast, and you can also do the passive imagers. Even though in the past, uh, even though in the past, the focus has been on, on, on uh, sounding instruments like infrared and, and microwave sounders. Okay, and then we are going to go to some sort of, um, if you can call it exercise. We, we are going to through how you can actually detect clouds from these measurements and the cloud properties which you derive. Uh, we will come to that, but something like where's the uh, cloud located in the vertical? What is the optical thickness of the cloud and things like that? Um, then I will have a few words on the actual limitations uh, when you do so. When you do derive those cloud properties, what are the limitations? And I'm, uh, those limitations I list here are not complete, but just give you a, a rough idea of um, what the limitations uh, can be. Uh, and then if we still have time, we, we come to some sort of applications. Uh, that's more a little bit my, some, some examples of my day-to-day -day, uh, work, basically, where we have cloud property data sets, which we compose and sort of analyze or use for any kind of ap application. And then we'll have maybe also one or two slides on the uh, more like towards the climatological uh, analysis. Okay, coming to the passive uh, visible and infrared images. Uh, just two examples I'm going to show here. This is uh, Siviri and this is AVHR. Uh, most of you will know Siviri is on a, ge in a geostationary orbit. Uh, the height is quite, quite large. It's uh, 36,000 kilometers, so pretty far away from the... Uh, from the Earth's surface, which kind of also limits the kind of uh, resol spatial resolution you can have with these instruments. Uh, and then the other opposite part, if you want, are polar orbiting satellites, which, you know, like um, overpass the polar regions and they, they are, the Earth is just churning underneath them. And uh, uh, you have different NOAA satellites or quite a series of NOAA satellites. And uh, most of them actually carried an AVHR instrument, which has uh, less spectral information, but it's, uh, it's longer, it's available for a longer period of time. So uh, those instrument, uh, this instrument family is, is very well suited for some sort of uh, climatological analysis. While Siviri exists since Meteosat 8, which, is, uh, uh, which was launched in 2003 and is operational or data is available since 2000, beginning of 2004. Uh, however, this is of, of course high temporal resolution and maybe for now casting purposes a little bit more suited or actually way, way more suited than uh, the polar orbiting instruments. And those, uh, those two are just two examples. Uh, there are more, just to mention it here, it's MODIS, ATSR, and the um, familiar, the uh, instruments of the same family, it's ATSR and a, um, ATSR2, and then MARIS, and there are a couple of more, a couple of instruments more of uh, this kind. And then, um, okay, starting with this slide, because in uh, passive imagers, uh, you should always remember that uh, we can't go down to any kind of spatial scales, right? So I just picked randomly four images from the internet, and you can, can see the, where the sources of those images are. For like, let's say, four different cloudy conditions. For here, you have some fair, uh, fair cloud conditions. Um, you have some very diverse clouds, and this, uh, I hope you can see the contrast here in the images. Uh, very diverse cloud uh, cloud types here. It's more homogeneous, sturdy form kind of. And here you have homogeneous and some overlying, some 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 other cloud layer on top of them. And if you imagine the cloud, uh, the the satellite pixel being like this, it's going to be. You just have in one channel, you have just one information in this box, which is some sort of, if you want, average information, right? So you will never be able to resolve smaller scale features, which are smaller than, in general, smaller than the satellite pixel itself. So everything you derive is some sort of mean for this box, if you want. And um, yeah, just to give you an idea, Siviri, of course, has some sort of three to five kilometer boxes here, depending where you, where you are on the Siviri disk. And then ABHR has something like one times one kilometer. Uh, same for MODIS. Maybe Maris is, um, is 250 meters. And the, the, the new VIRS instrument also has some sort of, uh, I think, 250 meters resolution, but still, we always have uh, a mixture of, of different signals in one signal, if you like. So this is just for you to, to remember. Um, okay, coming to uh, Siviri, I'm, I'm going to have two slides on this. I mean, most of you know the details. 
And you see in this paper, you can see even more details than I'm, I'm going to be listing here. Uh, this is the imaging cycle. It's 15 minutes. That's what we have to live with usually. There are some uh, rapid scan uh, modes that they every now and then start to make measurements with. And I think we are going to have some loops in this afternoon showing some of those two and a half minutes. Uh, is that right? I think. Showing some of those two and a half minutes uh, um, slots taken by Siberia. And then they, I think the area is very much uh, reduced, basically. But usually, operationally, you have like the 15 minutes resolution for this whole disk. And this is just some sort of zoom in into some part of this disk. And as I was saying, the special resolution is is uh, four to five kilometers in general. Okay, and this is a little bit. Um, just to make it clear, you mean with the image cycle, you will then it takes uh, to conduct the simulations image? Yes, yeah, so it takes it takes about. So just to repeat for the microphone, maybe it's uh, the uh, she was asking about the imaging cycle. Um, it's it takes 15 minutes to reproduce the same image, right? So you, you measure it. Actually, it the instrument takes 12 minutes to scan the whole disk. And then it does some data processing, and then the scan mirror goes up again, and then the next cycle starts 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, you will have the measurements of those uh, in this disk, basically. And then it's uh, <coughs> not only in one channel, but in, in those 12 channels, basically, or this is a high resolution visible channel, which is not covering the whole globe, but it's, uh, let's say, 11 channels uh, located in this spectral range here. And you can see them here by the spectral response functions. And maybe a little bit for the preparation, or as preparation for, uh, for the exercise uh, later on today, uh, you will get data of measured by a certain sub-area in, the, in these channels. And you're, you're going to work basically with those, those measurements. And uh, yeah, so we have a couple of channels here in the infrared, basically measuring uh, the emitted, emitted and uh, absorbed, or the emitted radiation coming from the Earth, and then the, you have the visible channels here, which are basically a pure reflected uh, sunlight, if you want, being reflected back to the satellite. Okay. And just to uh, generalize this a little bit, um, you will have, of course, here it's the curve of the emitted uh, um, radiation by the sun, and this is by the Earth. This is, of course, uh, normalized. And you have some sort of common spectral bands, which are usually on every uh, passive imager, uh, which are those here, and then you have maybe on EVHR, EVHR you only have one of those tools, so it's just one infrared channel. But the other ones are usually the, the common uh, spectral bands of passive imagers. And uh, the reason for that is uh, because they are sort of located in, in, in regions where you can uh, detect basically or infer most information you want to infer from the, from the uh, atmosphere. So you have basically located them more or less always in some sort of window region where you have, um, uh, the, there's, where there's no further absorption by the, by the pure atmosphere. Of course, if there are clouds on the way, uh, they will absorb and scatter the radiation, of course. And uh, if you do cloud observations, you want to, of course, pick those spectral bands because you don't want to have any other absorbing uh, um, matter basically in between. Okay, so just ABHR, for example, has those, those six channels, and MODIS has a couple, of, uh, a couple more channels, but uh, the core channels are also those being located in this spectral range. Okay, so now you know a little bit about passive images, and I just go ahead to how those, it's very, I'm gonna go very quickly over those slides, how this can be directly used for data assimilation to improve the short-term forecast. Uh, we did some studies in the past, uh, with using the Hurler model, which so is basically the uh, operational limited area model, for example, used by the Swedish Met Service. Uh, and if you do assimilate at a specific point, maybe I'm showing this here, if a specific point, a specific measurement of a satellite, and you have some sort of cross section through the model, and you don't assimilate any other observation, you can visualize this in this way, basically. So you have the Jacobians that tells you where this channel is, is uh, sensitive to in the vertical. And here you see, compared to control experiment, control experiment where you don't assimilate this, uh, this observation, how the, the analysis is changing. This is here, uh, I think it's um, moisture, basically. And you can see if you use like a clear sky observation or if there's a cloud there, you have different increments in your analysis. This is just uh, assuming a one a single observation at one specific uh, spot and if you do that 
more like spatially. This is the domain views back then. Uh, this is the location of the observations you get. And then if you slice now at 500 hectopascals, you can see the increments that are caused just by the assimilated observations of, of severe. And you have like a moisturing and the drying here at 500 hectopascals. And you, and you do that for a longer time period and sort of try to evaluate if, if this has a positive impact on the short term forecast. And uh, if you do so, uh, you come to this kind of, um, you can come to th this kind of plot where you see basically this is a pressure level here and this is the forecast length. And shown are always the difference in forecast score for different parameters here uh, compared to a control run. Right, so and every, everything which is blue here is, is negative, which tells you that the forecast scores has reduced with the new observations. And everything with this, which is red tells you that there's is, is an increase in root mean square error telling you the, the forecast has degraded at that level for that parameter at that forecast time. But as you can see in our experiments, we could basically prove that uh, those kind of observations have the potential for improving the forecast. You can see that for relative humidity and geopotential height. And then if we add some more, uh, some more observations and specific cloud affected uh, observations, you can see maybe not on this uh, screen here, but it's, if you look on the, on the monitor later on, you can see that you get even more improvements uh, so the, uh, for geopotential height and relative, relative humidity. And it also affects other parameters. Uh, and one reason for that is, of course, that the big advantage of severe in this case is that it has this high temporal resolution. It's, the spectral information is not, in terms of data assimilation, not as good as, for, as you can infer from um, sounding instruments like microwave sounding or infrared sounding instruments. But the high temporal resolution gives you a lot of information that can improve the forecast. Right, and it's, an, it's a nice feature to be uh, used on top of, let's say, AMSU A, AMSU B microwave sounding, uh, microwave imaging instruments. Okay, so this was just a little bit uh, a summary of how we can use it in data assimilation for short-term forecasts. Um, now we actually come to how the retrievals basically work or what you have to pay attention to if you try to use the, the actual measurements of the satellites to make some products out of it. And we start with cloud detection and then we come to the different uh, or some more cloud properties which you will derive or which you want to derive in those pixels which you have assigned to uh, uh, cloudy before. Okay, so this is one scene of Siviri. It's uh, June 2008, uh, one afternoon time in terms of UTC. Um, and this scene basically is going to accompany us a little bit through this um, lecture and also in the, af um, in the exercise afterwards. You will get data from, from this particular scene and you will try to uh, well develop a cloud mask algorithm, a very simple one, and uh, also some cloud up height and maybe some other parameters. Um, okay, so this is the scene we are gonna we are gonna um, work with in the next on the next slides and later on in the afternoon. Okay, so how do we detect actually clouds? So it's not it's not enough to actually see the clouds in these kind of RGB image, right? I mean, uh, for some for some applications it's enough, but for for many others it's not. You want to know like a, a yes no decision where where there's a cloud or where there's no cloud, and even this. Um, I have to say, even this RGB image, it's not just measured, it's also already combining um, two visible observations and one infrared information, or near-infrared information as well, to make this kind of nice RGB image, because Siberia doesn't have a real uh, red channel, if you want, so you have to, to do some tricks to actually get this very nice uh, RGB image here. Uh, of course, you can see some of the cloud, or most of the cloud features here, but you want to, of course, uh, have like a for most or for many applications sort of yes no decision where there's a cloud and where there's not. So having now plotted here a very pure measurement of uh, an infrared channel which is located at 10.8, uh, which is a window channel which can see pretty clearly through the atmosphere uh, unless it, uh, there's a cloud or a surface then in, in the way. But water vapor, for example, is not uh, significantly pure in the first approach significantly. Uh, making any, any difference here on the measurements. Okay. And as you can see, you have like the, the, the warm measurements on the surface where it's very warm. So you basically see the, the temperature in this channel, the temperature of the object you're looking at. Right? So and it's like you have 220 Kelvin here and 300 Kelvin. So it's, you, know, you see the warm surfaces where there is no cloud and you see the, 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 the clouds here, which are just 
cold, right? I mean, you can see that they are like 220 or maybe 230 uh, Kelvin. And, uh, but the thing is that not all of the clouds look the same in this image, right? Uh, not, all are, um, not all are so cold here and not all are basically so, so structured. So if you go down here, the contrast gets a little bit, uh, a little bit less, so it makes it a little bit more difficult to actually detect the clouds in those just from this particular measurement. And then you have to do some um, assumptions and some uh, tricks maybe to get uh, the real information where there are clouds down here in the image and where not. Okay, so just a couple of points which you want to pay attention to if you detect or if you, wanna, if you want to detect the clouds, which is uh, which you then can use in some sort of cloud screening procedure. And maybe you can uh, just remember one or two or three of those uh, for the exercise later on. Uh, so clouds are usually brighter than the Earth's surfaces in visible channels. Uh, this is, of course, only true in, uh, during daytime when you have the uh, reflected sunlight. Uh, clouds are usually colder, colder than the Earth's surfaces, as we saw in the previous image. But that's, of course, not always true. Um, and then it... You also have like water, you have of course water clouds and ice clouds in your, in your image usually. Water clouds reflect the radiation at short wavelength, uh, short wave infrared channels, uh, while the Earth's surface does not. So you have another feature maybe you can, uh, can use to distinguish between the surface and the, and the cloud. And then uh, another thing is that thin clouds usually are less uh, transparent for longer wavelengths, which you can, uh, so cirrus clouds, do not affect like measurements in those two channels uh, in the same way. So by looking at the difference, you can actually say a little bit about if there was a semi-transparent surface in the way or not. Uh, and then some, some more features here um, that, for example, water clouds during nighttime uh, are not real black bodies in the 3.7. Uh, so if looking at differences between those channels, you can, you can tell something about if they are water clouds or not. And then you can also use some sort of texture features in the image uh, to detect the clouds. Another possibility is when, when having severe and the high temporal resolution is that uh, if you look at, at the sequence of images and say that everything which is moving in the, in the loop is basically a cloud. So this is basically another approach you can, uh, you can go. And how, how do you account for that? Usually in, in retrieval methods, uh, you, one way is to implement like multispectral thresholding techniques that ac actually account for those features which we which I have mentioned here right so you just implement like a series of threshold techniques saying like if this different is, is higher or larger and or smaller than this and that then it's it's a high probab probability of having a cloud and and so on and uh, usually you can't have a general a general approach to that it usually depends all your threshold techniques depend on where you are on the globe, what's the, the surface type, what's the uh, illumination condition, what's the viewing angles, and so on. Um, and the uh, atmospheric background state, also the atmospheric state, which we usually take from NWP models or reanalysis uh, or similar. Yes, and sometimes you also want to use some sort of theoretical um, radiance, which, would, uh, which tells you basically what would have been the let's say the, the, the measured brightness temperature, if there would not have been a cloud in the way, right? And just by looking at what you measure and what the clear sky radiance would have been, uh, you can just tell something about the probability of, of cloud occurrence in that particular pixel. Okay. Uh, coming to just an example, if you implement this kind of um, threshold technique, uh, one example is given in this um, it's an uh, algorithm theoretical baseline document. Uh, it's actually the nowcastings of software, which was already yesterday, uh, mentioned yesterday by, by Katwin, I believe. It's a 2010 version, and that sort of uses all the measurements and gives you some sort of cloud mask. And it gives you two different uh, informations, or actually three information, which, which is like clear sky, and it says uh, cloud contaminated, and then the light gray pixels you see here are um, telling you cloud contaminated, well, whereas the, uh, the dark gray ones are, are cloud filled. So there's some uncertainty to, to those pixels where, where are, which are light gray. And um, it's then, then just up to you to sort of interpret those results if, if you believe there are, um, if you believe uh, there are clouds in, the, in that pixel or not. And you can, you can see this product corresponds very well to what you basically see in the, 
in the RGB image on the left side. Okay, so um, this of course doesn't work for all clouds and there are um, particular clouds or cloud types for which this doesn't uh, work always and to mention them and maybe some of you know uh, by experience already uh, those conditions it's uh, the first one would be like bright clouds of our bright surfaces and if you go back this would be sort of like uh, a condition where we have snow cover in Europe for example or any kind of other region of the world where you have snow cover and you have an over overlying cloud which and the visible just looks white, both look white, and you don't have a contrast, so you don't see any, any different, right? So those conditions are, are difficult. Uh, another is um, cold clouds over cold surfaces. Um, this is if you go back to the infrared image we had before, which is here. So if you have a cold surface, like, like in, during nighttime in the winter, let's say minus 20 or something, and then you have a cloud which also have minus 20 degrees uh, temperature, it looks just more or less the same in the in those infrared channels. So those conditions are also very, very difficult. And this, on a global scale, happens very often. Actually, if you look at uh, polar regions, right? You often have like cold surfaces and snowy conditions. So this, those two points very often happen in, in polar conditions. And that's why the sort of the remote sensing of clouds in those Arctic and Antarctic conditions are very difficult uh, all the time using these kind of instruments. The other thing also is that you sometimes have. Uh, that the cloud top is actually warmer than the surface, so it's actually inversed this ratio. This is uh, also sometimes, or yeah, it's sometimes happening over, over the Arctic Ocean, for example, where you have temperature inversions. Okay, so those are very difficult conditions which, which emphasize that you, you can't always have a general approach to all regions uh, on, the earth, on the Earth to, to do the same uh, cloud detection. Okay. Um, just one example, what I was uh, mentioning before, here you have, I think it's Turkey, and you have like the snow-covered uh, mountain regions, which is uh, magenta in this image, and you have some overlying clouds. But if you do some specific compositing of different channels, you actually can see the difference between, between the, the overlying clouds and the, the, the snow cover in between, which you can't access if you have just one simple threshold technique. But if you look, if you take more than just two uh, channels in a, in a very intelligent way, you can see the difference between the, the clouds because not all spectral properties are the same between snow and, and, and ice clouds. Okay, so once you have, uh, assuming that you have um, detected the clouds and specific pixels and you wanna, then you wanna of course, you want to know more about specific properties of the clouds and uh, I'm gonna go through a few, uh, a few of those properties which can be inferred with, uh, with a reasonable quality and which are of course are inferred on, uh, on in many retrieval systems and uh, maybe some of you have already used those. Um, and we basically start with uh, cloud top height or pressure, uh, which is, there's an example showing, um, <coughs> shown down on the slide for some orographic uh, induced um, cloud. which you can see, you have the flow here, the airflow basically from the left to the right, and you can see they are very thick, or the, the clouds are very thick at this point, and they get thinner and thinner when going more, more and more eastwards, right? And um, <clears throat> then you have, of course, a very difficult situation where you think this is very thick, and they, in this part of the cloud, you can, can have a very good estimate of the cloud top, so where the, the cloud top is basically uh, located in the vertical. Uh, while going more and more eastwards, the, uh, the signal you measure is more and more a mixture of the underlying surface and uh, the effect of the cloud here. So here it becomes more and more difficult because it's just transparent in the visible but also in the infrared. Um, yes, so basically here you have then contributions in your measurements coming from the surface and, and the cloud. And uh, this is of course just uh, yeah, one of the shortcomings of the uh, imager instruments is that you basically have just one pixel and just one measurement if you like, and so you just m more or less always see sort of the, the integrated, I think it's mentioned somewhere here, just the integrated signal in the particular pixel. So you don't have uh, that many informations about uh, that you can, informations that you can separate the surface contribution and the cloud contribution. <coughs> okay, um, having 
said that, this, is, uh, this slide is just showing a very simple approach, uh, how you can determine the vertical location of the cloud top. And uh, this is what I was also saying before, this is some kind of example you will be doing an exercise. Um, uh, afterwards, you will, you, will, you will be saying this is, uh, was really an, an easy example. And I'm just explaining this, uh, explaining this. Here you basically see the measurement in a particular pixel, which is uh, taken at the infrared channel, which is like 280 kelvins here. So this is just the measurement in the infrared channel, and uh, you have co-located to that a temperature profile, which might come from a radio sounding, which also might come from a NWP model, just co-located to that pixel, and you have the temperature profile. Here, just look at the solid line, and then you can just assume that if you have an op opaque cloud, so you don't have, you only see the contribution from the cloud and the channel, you can just have a look at, and you assume that your cloud is more or less a, a, a black body, um, or ha having black body um, properties, you can just go through the uh, temperature profile and look where those lines basically intersect, and then you can, you can uh, first approach would be you can place the cloud top of your cloud at this position saying that uh, well, you have 280 Kelvin measurement in the infrared channel here, and the temperature here is 280 Kelvin, so the, the cloud must be at that position. Okay. But this is, again, just uh, for opaque clouds. For transparent clouds, this doesn't work uh, that easy. Another example, uh, now we have a very low temperature measurement in the brightness temperature tunnel. Let's say 200, um, was it 25 Kelvin or something? And you do basically the same. You just go through the temperature profile and look at the specific uh, plot where those lines intersect, and you can tell, okay, this is the temperature of the cloud, or this might more or less be the temperature of the cloud top. So the cloud must be located at, was it 200 hectopascals? So the, the cloud top must be located. And uh, this very simple approach actually works for most clouds uh, very well. I mean, then the difficulty is, of course, to, to find out beforehand if you have an opaque cloud in a specific pixel and you have to do some preparing like co-locating the, the temperature profiles and so on. But after you have done that, and you are sure that you're looking at the opaque clouds, the, the approach is, is very simple, and it gives, it gives reasonable good results, I would say. Okay, just one more thing. It's a little bit um, more than that I was mentioning before, because here you have an, uh, a window channel where you can look through the atmosphere basically if there's no cloud down to the surface and then you have a channel which lies somewhere in some absorption band, band and this is one channel uh, the radiation in that spectral region is very sensitive to atmospheric water vapor and here you can basically see the water vapor features in the atmosphere but some clouds are basically even on top of those water vapor features and then using that additional information you can tell something more accurately about the, the cloud top and maybe you can uh, there are special uh, radiance ratio techniques which you can use to, to actually better characterize the cloud top height of semi-transparent clouds. So uh, by using those additional channels here, uh, you can, can get a better cloud top height or pressure estimate of, of those kind of clouds. Unfortunately, not all of the imagers have such a channel. I mean, Severi does have, so you can use this for Severi, but AVHR doesn't have a sounding channel or doesn't have a water vapor channel. So you can't use this approach for, for um, AVHR. Okay, coming to the next, um, oh no, staying at this uh, one more slide. This is just the example of the same scene uh, we had before. This is again the, uh, the RGB image on the left side. And uh, this cloud top pressure retrieval is also uh, documented in this, um, in this reference here. And you can see for this scene how the cloud top pressure basically looks like. And uh, it sort of confirms what you would guess already from these kind of images, but it, now we have it quantified where the clouds are located or the cloud tops are located. And you see those band of, this band of clouds here with, with a very high cloud top pressure. And you see some lower, lower level clouds and some frontal system here as well, which is, a, um, let's say, cloud top pressures, like 500 hectopascals or something. Um, okay. And you, you're gonna produce, uh, in the exercise, you're gonna produce this kind of image later on. Okay, some more cloud properties um, you want to look at. It's uh, more towards the uh, microphysical or optical properties of the cloud. So it's sort of the, the properties uh, on the, um, 
or in the cloud particle scale, if you want. And uh, just to clarify, what I'm going to talk about is the optical thickness, or the cloud optical thickness, the effective radius, and the phase. You want to know if uh, if it's liquid or if it's uh, uh, frozen, or maybe if it's if it's mixed. But the information content of passive images is very limited in this uh, respect. And then you have the total integrated mass of the cloud condensate. And uh, if you have if you assume everything to be liquid, it's going to be liquid water path, the vertically integrated liquid water condensate. And uh, if you assume everything to be ice, you, you um, can retrieve the ice water path, which is then the integrated frozen cloud condensate, and then and these uh, units. Um, the, the most common approach to retrieve the first two here, cloud optical thickness and effective radius, is the so-called uh, Nakajima-King approach, which has been documented already quite some time ago, and it's basically based on those uh, two features here, uh, which, which says that the reflectance of the clouds at a non-absorbing wavelength in a visible region is strongly related to optical thickness. Um, so then if you have such a channel, 0 0.6 or 0 0.8 micrometer, or 600, 800 uh, nanometers, which is shown down here, you can see the strong sensitivity of that reflectance due to uh, optical thickness. And optical thickness is, for example, just look at the blue, uh, blue lines for the, for the moment and the blue numbers. Optical thickness are those which uh, range from 2 to, uh, let's say, 250 on this, this side. And those lines are basically the ISO op uh, cloud optical thickness lines. So if a strong sensitivity of this reflectance with respect to cloud optical thickness. On the other hand, uh, the reflectance of clouds at an absorbing wavelength in the near-infrared region is primarily related to the particle effective radius. And now we look at this axis here. So this is a uh, near-infrared channel. We can see that the, uh, those lines are basically the ISO effective radius lines. And you can see the strong sensitivity of that reflectance just due to that property. And then if you have, <coughs> this is of course usually not, let's say, applicable everywhere. You have to have some sort of information uh, Usually before, beforehand, you do some uh, lookup tables calculations which contain the combinations of cloud optical thicknesses and effective radius, and they map it to the frequencies of those two channels. And this structure or pattern basically changes depending on the angle, depending on the, the satellite sun uh, geometries and where you are, maybe on the, on the, um, on the globe. So this is, uh, you have very uh, multi-dimensional multi dimensional uh, lookup tables you usually use, which you then have pre-calculated. And then you go to just to that particular pixel and pick those two reflectances, and then you look the result into your, uh, in, your, in your table, and then you get the information about the effective radius and the cloud optical thickness. And as I was saying, this was uh, already documented some time ago by Nakajima and King. And also property of this um, pattern is that ice clouds behave a little bit different here than water clouds. You can see water clouds are the, the red lines here, and the blue lines are um, the ice clouds. And uh, maybe that's also one feature you can actually use to, to determine the phase of the cloud. So there are different <laughs> algorithms, uh, uh, for example, documented here, which actually do retrieve the cloud optical thickness and um, effective radius for the same pixel. One, um, well, the first approach is using the ice properties, and then the second approach using the water properties. And then afterwards, you look at which uh, sort of model fits better the, the measurements, and then you can decide uh, which phase the cloud actually has. OK, and as I was saying, usually this is very time consuming to do it, very, uh, to do it online. So usually you have to have some sort of pre-calculated lookup tables um, which you want to use. And this is an example, the same scene again. Uh, this is now cloud optical thickness um, derived for each pixel which was identified to be cloudy by the cloud detection beforehand. So you can see the, the strong, uh, I hope you can see those uh, strong convective events here over, uh, let's say, Germany. And you also can uh, see very high cloud optical thicknesses here, which would range uh, well, to values even above 100. Um, one has to say, of course, that at some point there is some sort of saturation in the measurements. So everything which is above 100, um, it's, 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 you have to interpret those values very carefully because you lose sensitivities if you go to very optically thick
clouds. You, you usually can't say that much uh, about optical thicknesses when you are, once you are um, above 100 optical thicknesses. So it could be like 200, could be 150. So the sensitivity is very low at those ranges, but you can tell those clouds are optically very thick. And then going down to the other optical thicknesses range, you find uh, many clouds which actually have those cloud optical thicknesses. Um, yes. Okay, and uh, a very common approach to um, retrieve the integrated uh, liquid water path and ice water path, as I was mentioning before, it's like LWP and uh, IWP, so it's again the integrated uh, mass of cloud condensate, liquid and ice, uh, separately, where you do it only for one, for one pixel, you decide which, which kind of cloud you have in there, so you do only one retrieval in, in every pixel, once you have a passive imager. And um, there are common formulas, uh, formulas which convert your information of optical thickness and effective radius to liquid and ice water paths. And I'm not going to go into the theoretical details here, how those uh, formulas are derived, uh, but you can look it up here in Stevens' paper or maybe in Heimsfeld, there's a different one for ice water path. But you can use the uh, cloud of the thickness, which is tau here, and you have RE, which is the effective radius, and you have the, the density of liquid and ice water here, and then you can you have a factor here, which is um, slightly different depending on the approach of the vertical structure of the cloud condensate you, you basically assume. So if you, if you assume vertically homogeneous distribution of cloud condensate, your factor is going to be two-third. If you assume adi uh, adiabatically stratified uh, distribution, uh, it's going to be five over nine. So this is a slightly different approaches, which give uh, slightly different results, but there are different retrieval uh, schemes out there and uh, many use different. So there's no common actually uh, approach here. So some, some use, uh, use uh, two third and uh, some use the five or nine. Okay, then ice water path is basically similar, just using the, the ice, um, the density of ice. And uh, well, the alternative formula for ice water path is, is here documented here, which, which only depends on the optical thickness. So there are different uh, philosophical choices done by the different developing teams, and uh, so each team has its uh, own view on those things and do slightly different things, even though using the same uh, input data. Excuse me, but uh, this radius of the cloud particles is measured actually at the very top of the cloud, right? Yes, it is, yeah. Okay, uh, then this, you assume that the clouds are relatively thin, so that basically there's not much change of the radius of uh, cloud particles. Uh, yes, and it's, it's usually, I mean, the sensitivity of the, well, you measure in the visible infrared here, so your signal always will be from the very top of the cloud, and then you do some assumption about the vertical structure, and if you do so, you come up with those, you can calculate those, those factors, right? So this, uh, so this equation is the cloud condensate density of the Um... Yes, so, well, that's a, it's a nice, a nice question because, I mean, for example, MODIS has, has three different near-infrared channels, and if you do the retrieval of effective radius, you have three different results for effective radius, depending on the frequency. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, factor, the A factor, actually depend on that. I'm not sure. I, I don't think so, actually. Maybe Hartwig has an small, answer. A small um, dependency simply because you're in the media, so in the Okay, so now we have gone uh, through those parameters and this is just uh, an example of a visualization of a liquid water path and ice water path. And as I was saying before, usually you can't tell both at the same pixel because you only have the information of the cloud top. So you decide at some point, this is an ice cloud and this is a, uh, or this is a liquid cloud and then you assume everything basically that is affecting the radiance being the same phase. 
And that is, um, well, this approach holds for, for, for some cases, but for, for some it, it doesn't really. And if you look at, for example, uh, clouds that in Calypso profiles of cloud condensate, you can, uh, and it's of course your experience, not all clouds have the same face through the vertical, right? But uh, you are very limited with the passive imagers. You can only tell, usually only tell this, this is ice or this is liquid, and you, you do some sort of uh, assumption that everything is the same face and calculate the, uh, here's the ice water path and here it's the, the liquid water path, right? And you can see that those pixels which have, have a value here are screened out on this side because it's just the opposite face. Um, okay, so now we actually have looked at the, um, at the zoom, at the European uh, subset basically of Severi, but if you didn't just uh, visualize this for the whole Severi disk, you had these kind of uh, plots. You have the cloud mask here, and you have the, um, the cloud top pressure. You can very nicely see the uh, ITZZ here, and have the optical thickness, the phase, telling you here it's uh, ice clouds at the cloud top, and it's liquid clouds in the subsequent uh, regions here. And uh, this is in the uh, liquid water path, and this is the ice water path. This is just to, to show you how the uh, full disk um, visualization looks like of those uh, parameters. Okay, so um, yeah, so remember the things I've told you here because this is going to be uh, the topic of our exercise later on. And it's actually, um, it's going to be a little bit of fun, I, I believe. Um, okay, so there are some uh, limitations to those retrievals. Uh, and usually you have not, well, let's say every retrieved cloud property has its limitations and uh, in terms of quality. And uh, usually you have to have some sort of validation sources. And I'm not going to go into any details here. I just want to tell you that there are some uh, reference observations out there, ground-based, but also space-based. And once, we, uh, once the a train was established, we got uh, Calypso and CloudSat, which give you a very accurate um, information about, for example, uh, about the cloud mask uh, and cloud top height, so the vertical position of the cloud, but also some other parameters because those instruments are active instruments. So they have a very, um, they give you very accurate information about the parameters uh, they retrieve. And another one is maybe uh, AMSR E, which is uh, also an aqua, which is a microwave imager, which gives actually a very accurate estimate of the liquid water um, path of, of liquid clouds, at least over ocean, over ocean regions. So having, having those instruments give you a space-borne reference which, which you can then use to, to validate your, um, let's say, severe or passive image of retrievals. Uh, just one, one thing to pay attention to is that always the spatial resolutions and the coverage looks very, very different uh, between the different uh, satellites. Here you have the CloudSat uh, curtain or footprint here, which is just the small blue line. You have, let's say, AVHR. Uh, this is a, diff a specific resolution here, which is the, the small rectangle that's here, but it basically a severe pixel would also look like this in this scene. But you can see that you actually, the, the, the number of co-located pixels are usually very <coughs> limited, if you want, uh, con considering the, the full uh, globe. And you always have to pay attention to the different resolutions of the footprints. You have to do some assumptions to actually be able to use the information of different satellites to validate others, basically. And um, um, just summarizing some of the limitations of those cloud properties derived from passive images, it's, um, as I was saying before, <coughs> I believe that uh, usually optically thin clouds are problems. Um, because you have a passive instrument, uh, active instruments like Clouds Calypso do see the optically thin clouds um, much better, but passive images don't. And if you plot sort of the sensitivity of the probability of detection on this axis here with one here and zero here. So the probability of detection of clear sky and cloudy cases as a function of cloud optical thickness, which you can derive from Calypso, for example, you can see basically this red curve telling you that if you go more and more to, to thicker and thicker clouds, uh, you get a, a much better probability of detection, right? And it, it also tells you that clouds down here, maybe below 0.3 optical thicknesses are sometimes uh, actually miss because you just don't, don't see them in those passive instruments. So this is something you have to keep in mind that optically thin clouds 
usually are a big problem in those, those products. Uh, related to that is um, the cloud top estimates. Um, it's not only, even though if you have a thick cloud, the, the first layers on the top might be very thin. If you have some, some sort of source, uh, thin source on top of the, of the cloud or at the top of the cloud, your cloud top estimate won't basically see those layers until you reach a certain optical thickness, which, which actually says that your cloud top estimate might often be very, let's say in, if, you, if you talk about cloud top height, it's, it's going to be underestimating the cloud top height compared to like an ac active instrument because you can't see the, the optical thin layers at the cloud top. And if you draw this some sort of this, this course or this bias and the standard deviations compared to an active instrument uh, using severe here, Oh, no, this is AVHR. But if you classify or if you separate that for different cloud types, and we just let's just look at this here. This is uh, three different retrieval schemes. All of those schemes have big problems for thin clouds. This is uh, transparent or semi-transparent source clouds here. Yeah. So all of those retrieval schemes have big problems when identifying the vertical position of that of those of that cloud type, basically. And then there are other cloud types which which work much better. So optically thin clouds are not just a problem for cloud detection, but also for the cloud top height retrievals. Um, another limitation is a little bit the uh, spatial representativeness, um, in particular for, let's say, severity. And if you look at specific regions which are coming closer and closer to the edge, and it's also a little bit uh, present already for Europe, that you actually have a very, um, you don't look from the top, right? You have a very slant uh, view, if you like. And so you actually see something which m might not belong actually to this uh, exact geographical region, but might, might belong to a pixel being just, just, well, a region being next to it. So you have some sort of parallax effect that you see the cloud, and it doesn't belong maybe not to that particular pixel which is underneath, or to a region which is underneath, but maybe a little bit shifted. And it gets, this problem gets uh, more and more significant when you go more and more to the, to the edge of the, the disk. And a little bit related to that is that uh, if you, of course, look at uh, some specific, let's say, convective clouds more from the side, you overestimate the cloudiness uh, compared to when you look from the top or directly from, from the bottom. So, um, and this is actually shown in this graph here. If you compare the, the, the sort of the mean cloudiness for a certain region uh, compared to a uh, more or less directly downward looking instrument, it's, it's modus here you can see that you have a strong overestimation when you go more and more to the to high scan angles of severity so and then so going to to the end of the the disk basically you get um, significant overestimations which can on average be like 10% or so maybe a little bit more maybe a bit less depending of course on the on the regions you're looking at um, okay and then you also have for maybe a last limitation is for the cloud optical properties you usually have some difficulties for high scan angles and for high uh, settle, uh, sun zenith angles, which is in the uh, retrieval scheme we, are, we have implemented. It's, it's, it's sort of cut at this uh, line here, which is a scan angle of uh, 72 uh, degrees, so zenith angle of the satellite, basically. But also, if, if you have uh, like sun, uh, sun zenith angles larger than 70, it's also uh, omitted those, those regions. And this is a, a strong limitation as well. So here you can see the cloud mass. You can basically do it reasonably well up to the, pretty much to the edge of the, of the disk. But uh, usually the cloud optical properties are limited a little bit more spatially just due to the fact uh, of those uh, viewing geometries. Okay, and then the, well, one obvious limitation, of course, is it's not listed here, but I was mentioning it before that you have just one pixel and you can just tell this is liquid or this is ice usually. Maybe you can tell if it's mixed, but you, you don't get any information about the vertical structure of the cloud. Right. Okay, so we, now we had the uh, limitations of those properties or cloud property retrievals. And I now go a little bit towards uh, what my day-to-day uh, -day basically work um, contains, and that's the, the basically not just looking at specific um, images for specific times of the day or whatever, but collecting all those informations, all those uh, retrievals over longer uh, time periods to compose data sets which can be used for some any kind of statistical analysis or even for uh, climatological analysis. 
And um, this is basically two, um, let's say, data sets we are, we are currently working with. One is based on Severi, and I'm going to be focusing on the next slide on this Severi data set, which is then, well, it, it basically we use the, the software I was, I was showing before examples of, but we do that for each time slot, and maybe, maybe a little bit uh, reduced, but every hour, but we do that for the full range of available severe measurements. And that would be uh, for this, when, when we did this, we limited this to the end of 2011, but we started at the beginning of 2004. So we do the retrievals of cloud properties for each, uh, almost each time slot that severe is, is measuring. And then we compose a whole, eight-year data set, which you can use to do some, any kind of uh, statistical analysis. Uh, one thing to pay attention to is that, um, of course, in the beginning, MeteorSat 8 was the operational satellite. MeteorSat 9, which was launched or taking over in 2007, yeah, the, uh, 2007 the operational service, uh, has the, the same instrument, but uh, it's usually calibrated in the same way and built in the same way, but once it's in space, it usually you have uh, very tiny or maybe also sometimes a significant difference in the calibration accuracy, uh, which is not that significant for, for severe here, but it's more for, I come back to that for EBHR. Uh, but this is just showing the, the availab availability of severe measurements, which we use to then actually do the retrieval of the cloud properties. It's the blue uh, regions here, and then it's um, where the next severe was, was, was taking over and at uh, Meteosat. Uh, nine platform, and then you of course sometimes have maintenance where the other satellite takes over the operational service and then fills in those those gaps. So we basically have like eight years of those data uh, composed in a data set, and I'm just going to show a, a few um, applications basically. So one of the usual applications is, is uh, looking at some sort of uh, summaries of the data. So you don't want to if you want to have a general classification of specific cloud properties of the specific <coughs> regions, you don't want to look at one, one million uh, severe time slots, right? So you want to have some sort of aggregated information. And uh, this is just showing like the, the mean cloud fraction, which you take then from averaging the, the cloud mask information in each, in each pixel. And this is for one specific uh, month, which is July 2010. And basically see that, yeah, so the mean cloud fraction, you can see regions where you have uh, just little clouds or, only a few clouds and regions where you have a lot of clouds in this, in this uh, particular month. Um, and then some other examples is the liquid cloud fraction, which is basically the ratio between the occurrence of liquid clouds relative to the occurrence of clouds in general. So you have some sort of how, how much percentage basically is, is uh, characterized by liquid clouds in a certain, in a certain pixels. And here you can basically see the ITCZ where you often have ice clouds. And you have the uh, subs uh, subsidence regions here and here, stratocumulus regions, often that you have uh, more or less always uh, liquid clouds. Another example is the cloud optical thickness. Uh, yeah, similar story here. You have high, very high optical thicknesses in the ITCZ, and also for some uh, for some clouds we had we had over Europe here in this particular month. And last example is the uh, I'm sorry, last example is the uh, liquid water path, basically summarized in, in the same way. Okay, but you, you don't want to just look at the, the first uh, two moments, basically, of a distribution. So you don't want to have just the, the average and the standard deviation. You want to maybe sometimes also look at uh, the distributions of occurrences itself, basically, because the, uh, if you don't have a Gaussian distribution, your, your mean and uh, standard deviation maybe doesn't tell you all the information you want to have. So if you look at sort of the, the temporal frequency of occurrences, for, for certain cloud properties. Um, this is shown, for example, in, in these, on this slide. Here we look at uh, cloud optical thickness. And it's basically, for, the, for a specific month, we pick basically the frequency of clouds with cloud optical thicknesses between uh, 0 and 3.6, so optically thin clouds, relative to the occurrence of, of all clouds. So and you can see that uh, maybe you have values up to uh, almost 100% here that you have many regions where you have uh, uh, clouds very often optically very thin, right? You can see the, the, all of those red regions in this particular month, right? And then the opposite basically is uh, now here it's the relative occurrence of, of clouds with high optical thicknesses with, uh, let's say, in the range of uh, 23 to 100, 
also shown relative to the total occurrence. And you can also see the, already see that the scale is, is different here because this is, uh, it's, it's way less frequent basically than in, uh, let's say those on, on, in, on average basically on this uh, disk. And if you pick out specific regions, now we have a European region here and uh, an, an oceanic region, the stratocumulus region here, and you can see basically the distributions of those uh, clouds during that month, you can see that you don't have a, a Gaussian distribution, right? But it's, it's, there's some uh, significant uh, schooners uh, here in this as well. And you can very nicely see which clouds in these regions occur more, more frequent than other clouds and, and so on. So this is a very nice sort of summary to, uh, to avoid looking at one million different uh, severe time slots, but have it more like in a summarized way without averaging all information away, if you like. Okay, another example is uh, if you don't do that just for one parameter, but uh, look at uh, parameter combinations. And uh, going a little bit back, there was some time ago, uh, I think the ISCIP, the ISCCP people, which are it's like an uh, American uh, research team, which uh, well started actually some time ago to, to uh, compose cloud property data sets. And they... Um, divide the different cloud types uh, in different, into different regions here in this cloud obligate thickness, cloud top pressure uh, histogram, right? So if you have, on average, if you have a cloud obligate thickness in this range and let's say a cloud top pressure in this range, it's, it's uh, very often altocumulus clouds. And then you can go ahead and, and uh, define all those other, or describe all those other boxes here. And by collecting basically in each grid, bo uh, grid box, the, the number of occurrences of clouds with specific combinations of cloud optical thickness and cloud top pressure, you can basically do some sort of statistical or climatological analysis of uh, which clouds do occur with, with uh, which frequency, basically, and, and, and where do they occur. And then if you basically take out, um, well, first of all, if you, if you aggregate over the full severe disk, you get these kind of uh, image here, which is then, well, as I was saying, that's the, the relative uh, occurrence of clouds with specific combinations of cloud optical thickness relative to the total occurrence of clouds. And you can see those two clusters here, basically, which is uh, usually most of the time corresponding to liquid clouds down here and ice clouds down uh, up here. Um, and if you then, so you can see on average, if you like, over the full disk, you most of the time you have low-level clouds, uh, most of the time liquid actually, low-level low liquid clouds with this um, cloud optical thickness and cloud top pressure, which are stratocumulus and maybe also uh, cumulus clouds. But if you then just plot those regions which are defined here, let's say cirrus, which is this box, and uh, stratocumulus, this box, and plot this uh, sort of aggregated over all those bins here, and again showing this as, as a relative frequency, you can see very nicely like the stratocumulus regions uh, that they are dominant in those, those uh, regions indicating by the, indicated by the red and yellow color here. And then in contrast to that, it's the cirrus clouds. You can see how often cirrus clouds occur relative to the total occurrence of clouds um, in each grid box. And you can see, you can identify very nicely specific regions in this month again, uh, how often cirrus clouds actually occurred. So this is a very nice application of, of basically uh, collecting the combined uh, retrievals of, of cloud top and uh, cloud optical thickness. Uh, the last application of this kind is um, you can now not only basically summarize or average, let's say, cloud fraction or liquid water path just using all informations, but still separating that for different hours of the day to get some sort of mean diurnal cycle for each uh, grid box. And that's basically shown here. This is cloud fraction. And it's in this image, um, I don't want to go into detail, but it, it only shows basically the maximum and the, the minimum of cloud fraction in each grid box as a, as a difference, basically, which tells you for this month um, a little bit about the, the amplitude of the cloud, um, the diurnal cycle of the cl uh, cloud fraction. And on the right side, it's liquid water path. So high values here indicate you have a high amplitude in the diurnal cycle for this particular month. Uh, this is for, for cloud fraction, this is for liquid water path. And then again, if you pick out specific regions, it's again the European region here and the Atlantic region, and you just, 
Well, show the mean diurnal cycle for that particular month in that particular box. You get those graphs here. The dashed line down here is the European one, which for this particular summer month, you have a nice diurnal cycle of uh, mean cloud fraction in this region, which um, well, confirms, of course, that you, if you have a convective uh, situation, that uh, most of the convection is going to be happening in the afternoon. And you have, an, so you have more uh, clouds in the afternoon than in the morning or in the, in the, in the, during the night, right? So this is basically confirmed. But it's also very, affected, uh, very much affected by any kind of synaptic uh, event. So you won't see this kind of feature for every month and, uh, in the European region. But for this month, it basically confirms that you have uh, more convection in the afternoon. And then, uh, so in contrast to that, you have the stratocumulus region here, where you have uh, specific effects which, which lead to a specific diurnal cycle of cloud fraction, also of liquid water path. And uh, you get basically this kind of um, diurnal cycle. And th this is very known, and many studies are, uh, exist that actually investigate these kind of diurnal cycle of uh, properties, uh, of cloud properties in those stratocumulus regions. Yeah, and this is then basically the same, but for liquid water paths. And yeah, one restriction, of course, for, for liquid water paths or any kind of optical property retrieval is that you only can do that with passive, Im passive imagers during daytime. So you won't have any information during nighttime. This is a very strong shortcoming, but it, there's basically nothing we can, we can do about it because we need the visible information. And then, I mean, for, this, for those two regions, the, uh, the signal is not that clear for this particular month, but I just also wanted to show you that. I mean, this is very not very known. The, um, in the stratocumulus region, the, the descending or the de decreasing uh, liquid water path during daytime. And for Europe, it's not that clear. It's a little bit noisy here, but it seems to be in some sort of a little bit more like in the before lunchtime and then in the morning than in the afternoon. But this is, uh, you would have to have more data to really get some sort of climatological characteristics out of this. But this is a very nice, another very nice example I, I find that uh, where you can actually use data sets which, which are composed of uh, months and years of data to do these kind of application and uh, analysis. Okay, so I'm, I'm coming to the last point here, which then goes a little bit further towards the climatological analysis. Um, it's uh, now, well, considering the right side of the, the slide, we are now looking at AVHR. As I was saying before, it's an, it's an old instrument. It has less spectral channels than Severi, but it's, it still has the, the key spectral bands. And it already exists since the end of the 70s, basically. It's not shown here, but uh, it's, it's going to be shown on the next slide. So this is actually on purposely, this instrument is built and sent out in space with the same characteristics um, again and again. You can see the different satellites here. It's the satellite numbers and then the time period, the, the cover. And by doing so, you have, you have the, the possibility to do some sort of climate analysis using the same instrument, which more or less is, is calibrated in the same way and has the same, uh, well, more or less the same optical and um, orbital and uh, spectral characteristics. But uh, if, you, if you go into more details, you find there are still differences between the different AVHRs. But this is, this is a passive imager which gives you some sort of possibility for a long-term um, climatological analysis of cloud properties. And this is now again sort of a more sophisticated plot than this here, uh, telling you all the NOAA satellites um, that basically had an AVHR-like instruments uh, mounted on them, and it's uh, basically not complete here. This build was, this image was, was done um, some time ago. So what is missing here is, is NOAA 19, which has been launched in the meantime, and also the METOP uh, program, which, which is actually continuing un until 2020, which gives you then the possibility to have a long-term AVHR-based cloud property data sets um, spanning 40 years, then in 2020. 2020. For the time being, we have about uh, 30 years of data. So this is something we can work with in, in, climatological, in climatological sense. And that's what we do. Um, there's one, well, one of the, um, as I was mentioning before, there's a couple of di uh, difficulties. One is, um, for example, that you send out the, the satellites. So this is polar, polar orbiting satellite base, basically, you send them into space, but they sometimes drift a little bit, which means that they go away a little bit from the original uh, altitude, go higher or lower, and then what's happening there is that they are 
actually changing the local overpass time at a specific spot. So they may actually be arranged to overpass the same spot on Earth at the same local time all the time. But uh, due to the uh, feature I was mentioning, they, during their lifetime, they actually change a little bit the local overpass time. So this is the time here, and this is the year. The different colors are the different satellites, but it's all contain the same instrument. And you can see that, for instance, uh, this is NOAA 11 here, which started to be overpassing each region on Earth and considering local time. Let's say, um, I think it was half past, half past one in the afternoon. And over time, over the six years lifetime of the satellite, it has actually shifted two or three hours towards the afternoon. So this is actually a, this is actually a problem since, since we know that most or many cloud properties might have a significant diurnal cycle. So if you just uh, basically plot, if you make just a time series out of this single instrument, you will see some differences which just occur just due to the uh, shift in the overpass time. So there doesn't have to do anything to do with a an, an, an trend signal or whatever. It's, 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 it's al already significant uh, just by this kind of, kind of features. You, you always have to pay attention to that uh, some of your signal uh, jumps or something else in your, in your time series might just come from, from those properties. Another um, difficulty is that you, as I was mentioning before, it's, it's calibrated in the same way on the ground, but then it's sent up in space and uh, might still behave a little bit differently. I mean, there are, for the infrared channels, they have some onboard calibration, which looks at like a, like a black body and it calibrates itself. But for the visible channels, there's nothing like that on board. Um, so I don't have a graph of that here, but if you would plot just the measurement of a specific visible channel for all the AVHRs over that 30 year time period, you would see some inconsistencies and some jumps in between. So you have to have, uh, you have to apply some sort of intercalibration method to make the already the measurements at their level basically very homogeneous. And then you can start doing the uh, uh, retrieval of cloud properties and analyze time series. Um, okay, and another, well not problem, but feature is basically that uh, going, coming to the 90s and uh, after 2000, we got more and more AVHRs in space and uh, you should pay attention to what you average together because now you have also information from, from other, if you would average everything together and compare that to this, you would here in this average, uh, let's say you would have um, also information from different uh, times of the day, right? Which would then create you, create you some sort of trend or might create you some sort of trend in the time series. And I'm not gonna go into the, the, the details of this plot, but it, it, you can see that all those problems um, show up in, in any kind of time series you have. So you have to pay attention to, uh, to that and correct for, for, for some of those features. Okay, so this is just basically summarizing that the limited time, uh, lifetime of each satellite and the drift and the aging of the satellite, uh, so getting less and less accurate maybe in, uh, over time, uh, complicate the co composition of homogeneous and long-term cloud property data sets. Right? And there are intercalibration methods specifically for AVHR, it's a document here for the visible channels, there, but there's also some uh, potential for improving the uh, infrared channels and it's, there's one paper out here which, which shows this pro potential. Um, yeah, this is just showing like a global picture now since we have AVHR, it's, it's covering the whole globe. Um, you have different time scales, you have, we average over and you show like the standard deviations over. Um, and, and if you have like a 30 year time period of homogeneous data, you can just start doing some, some analysis with that in a climatological sense. And this is uh, again just showing that like the mean 30 year mean of uh, cloud fraction over the whole globe. And uh, this is just, yeah, so cloud fraction, you can do that for each cloud property you derive. And you can do some sort of climatological mean or mean climatological analysis on those kind of things. But you can also pick out specific regions or the full globe and do like a time series analysis. And what we have done here is basically the, some sort of anom anomaly plot for Germany or some sort of rectangle which describes the location of Germany. Uh, and it's, before that it has been, uh, the data has been trend corrected and um, the, the mean diurnal, the mean seasonal cycle has been removed. So now we have some sort of more and more, uh, more or less clean anom anomaly plot 
showing like the red regions, giving you an over, on, like in uh, more clouds than on average, and um, or cloudiness over Germany, average over Germany, and uh, the blue regions here give you like um, less clouds or less cloudiness compared to the cli climatological mean, and there are many ups and downs here, and I don't want to explain each of those spikes, but maybe some of you remember the the gray. Uh, winter and spring here in Germany, and you can clearly see that um, in those anom anom anomaly plots here where you have this red here. It's not the first time actually this happened uh, when looking at this, this data, but there are other, but uh, you can see it's nice to see that, that uh, the, your observations you make outside actually also show up in these kind of data sets and confirm basically each other. So here's the strong, the strong uh, cloudiness that occurred here in, uh, in winter, over Germany winter and uh, also in spring a little bit. Okay, and the, the last application of those climatological data sets I want to mention is um, towards the cloud phase, if you like. So because uh, the freezing of clouds, it's very a hot topic, basically, uh, in modeling communities, but also in observ observing communities. So basically the question is, when, when do clouds freeze? So when do they convert from liquid to ice? It, it doesn't happen at zero degrees C, and it doesn't just happen at minus 10. Uh, it happens somewhere between, uh, let's say, zero and minus, minus 40, and that has uh, different uh, reasons, cause different uh, behaviors. Might be like the uh, dynamical regime, and might be so the difference between strati stratiform clouds and convective clouds. Uh, but it also might, um, the presence of different aerosol types might have an effect because you need to have some sort of uh, yeah, ice nuclei where, you, where your, your, your drops basically freeze on. And different aerosol types um, affect that efficiency differently. And this is just one way, I have to say this is very preliminary still, but um, if you have like a long-term data set, you can do a climatological or 30-year analysis, let's say on global scale or for, for certain regions where you just plot sort of the occurrence of liquid water clouds, uh, relatively speaking, uh, as a function of cloud top temperature to see how often do liquid clouds occur for certain cloud top temperatures, to get a sort of a feeling for when clouds actually uh, do freeze. And then you can, of course, do that for different regions. This is like a zonal mean here, and you can see the isolines for different temperatures and the ratio of liquid clouds that uh, exist at those temperatures. And then you can try, it's a very difficult topic, you can try to separate that for different uh, aerosol contaminations, if you like. And um, well, the, the problem here is, of course, to have some sort of stability in your data set and have the same accuracy in different regions, but also have sort of some aerosol information at the same time. And it usually, if you have a cloudy pixel, you, you have a hard, you're having a hard time to retrieve the, uh, let's say, aerosol optical depth or the, to prove some existence of heavy aerosol loadings. But uh, sometimes you can do some, let's say, assumptions of that you have a nearby aerosol measurement uh, or a measurement of the aerosol optical depth and, and the cloudy pixel, and you can sort of make some connection. You're saying that it's the same air mass or whatever, so you can maybe tell that you have a specific aerosol type or high aerosol loading, and you have this kind of behavior in terms of glaci glaciation or freezing process of the clouds. So uh, again, this is very preliminary, but you can see, you, you might see some some signal here, but it's very limited in terms of, of data we have looked at in this uh, specific topic. But uh, you've also find other um, papers which, which tell you actually different shapes of those S-curves. Right? A few years back, the, the, those curves uh, still started here, and there are also some ground-based measurements, I think, at, in Leipzig, I think you have done so. And um, so doing, looking up with a LIDAR and um, looking also looking at uh, the clouds of temperature and the occurrence of liquid and ice clouds. And um, depending on the instrument you use and depending on the approach, you get different curves. But uh, after all, those kind of informations actually improve your understanding of, of specific um, cloud features, I would think. OK, well, the last thing is uh, just five minutes left. Uh, you can, of course, use your full data set 30 years to actually also evaluate uh, models like climate models uh, or also era interim reanalysis and it's kind of hard 
because usually clouds in the models are not the same as the clouds in the in the satellite. And what you, uh, what the re researchers more and more do nowadays is to develop um, specific simulators which are employed in the models which simulate what the satellite would have seen in terms of spatial and uh, temporal sampling and also in terms of uh, spectral sensitivity, which is then a more one-to-one -one comparison you can do. But uh, still already with those data sets, you can, can do simple comparisons to models and sort of evaluate, um, evaluate them. Okay, and there are a couple of data sets out there. We have one, uh, which is this one, and there are other. Uh, as I was mentioning before, you can, uh, when you get the uh, presentation afterwards, you can look those up and they have sometimes different approaches and different um, uh, results as well, but uh, yeah, you can look that up and uh, different teams all over the world do this kind of research. Okay, so coming to the end of my presentation, I'm just having two slides uh, of summary. Uh, just reminding you of what um, uh, we have talked about during this presentation. So I gave a, I gave an overview of passive imager instruments, while very limited and with a focus on severity. Um, I did show that you actually can assimilate the measurements of passive imagers directly in NWP models too, and there's some potential to improve the short-term forecast based on that information. Um, I talked about how you can identify cloud masks, how you can de detect those in different uh, pixels, and also that for all subsequent cloud retrievals, uh, you might want to have, or you usually have to have, a cloud mask beforehand. Um, yeah, so I, I gave an overview over specific cloud properties which you can derive uh, with passive imagers. Uh, there are certainty limitations, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't say I mentioned all of them, but uh, a few limitations were mentioned in this presentation. And then uh, once you have done that, you can, once you have, once you are sure about the, the quality of retrievals and um, you can compose uh, midterm and long-term data sets and start doing climatological or any other kind of analysis in, uh, in a statistic, statistical or some other um, way, if you like. And uh, I did show quite a few uh, references and you can look those up afterwards. Um, okay. That's it. Thank you very much.